On today's Locked On NHL podcast, Eastern Conference Edition, we take a look at the four teams that missed the playoffs last year in the Metro. Which one of them can possibly make it in this year? Plus, the Leafs are sold. We'll have all of that and a lot more coming up on today's Locked On NHL podcast. Your Locked On NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to the Wednesday edition of the Locked On NHL Podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I want to thank everyone who makes Locked On NHL your first listen every day. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so you get new episodes as soon as they drop. Today's episode is brought to you by GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off your first purchase. I am Gil Martin. I am in for Ross Levitan and uh, the familiar face among the two of us here on the Wednesday show, Mike DiStefano. Mike, how you doing? Doing well, Gil. Doing well. Training camps have uh, opened up around the NHL, so uh, the the real stuff is starting. You know, I mean, I guess the real stuff doesn't start until o- October, I suppose. You could argue it doesn't start until April, but uh, <laughs> things are close, man. Things are close, and there's a lot going on in the NHL. Yeah, hockey is in the air. You feel that little cool air starting to creep in. It, oh, it, yeah. is, it, it is hockey time uh, for sure. Now, we're going to take a look at the – teams last year that did not make the playoffs from the Metropolitan Division. So four teams to focus on. And uh, let's let's kick it off with the Pittsburgh Penguins. Yeah, I mean, the Pittsburgh Penguins, like it's a team that just missed out on the playoffs. Like last year, they were kind of in there, uh, a possibility that they could have made it. They made that late push. Crosby kind of put the team on his back uh, in a way. But, uh, you know, the Washington Capitals ended up sneaking in there. So the Penguins, they just signed uh, Crosby to a new deal. What did they? They ended up adding a couple of pieces to their team. Anthony Bavillier, they added Kevin Hayes. Um, Cody glass, I believe also ended up, uh, getting there. And then there was the big trade they made for Rucker McGrory, um, that they got a a talented young prospect from the Winnipeg jets. So, you know, a a few different additions there, there's always going to be some swap ins and swap outs, obviously when it comes to, uh, to the NHL, but you know, I, I'm I'm not sure I'm I'm too high on the Penguins this year. You know, last year was finally the first time you know since Sid really became uh, I think it was what since his second year in the league that they didn't make the playoffs. So I don't think they did a whole lot to get that much better. Uh, to be quite honest with you, I'm I'm not so high on the Pittsburgh Penguins this year. It's tough. I mean, I understand where they're coming from. You've got a, a an all time great talent in Sidney Crosby. You, you just signed him to a two-year extension. I mean, we didn't know for sure what the details would be, but we knew he wasn't going anywhere, barring mm-hmm. something very unexpected. You want to try to win another cup for him. You got, you know, Evgeny Malkin, Chris Letang. Uh, you got Carlson. I mean, these are veteran players who all are in it for one more shot, but that also takes up a lot of your salary cap. And do you have enough talent and depth to surround those players with enough quality pieces to be a playoff team? Well, that and goaltending, like what are they going to get out of Tristan Jari? He was so up and down last season. Like it's just, you need dependable goaltending to, to win in this league. And, and neither Jari or Nadelkovic were able to give him that last year. That would be a big plus if they got the goaltending and that power play. Remember how abysmal that power play was last year too. That was another big issue that the, that the, the, the uh, Penguins had last season, like one of the worst power plays in the league. I guess that's what you're hanging your hat on. If you're a Pittsburgh Penguins fan, if you're Kyle Dubas and you're Sidney Crosby, it's well, the power play couldn't possibly be as bad as it was a year ago. You know, we, we get a couple more power play goals, probably results in a few more points. And if we can get a little bit more consistency between the pipes, you know, uh, perhaps this they, they can compete for a play. I think they will compete, but maybe they can sneak in to the playoffs. But uh, from, from an objective point of view, I don't know if I view them as one of the top, we'll say, eight teams in the Eastern Conference anymore. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you on that. And how does a team with, the components that the Penguins had 
I mean, we talked about Crosby and Malkin and Carlson and Latang, and and I mean, they had Jake Gensel. I mean, how do you struggle on the power play with all that talent? It made no sense. It really made no sense. Uh, they were 30th. Their power play was 30th. It was 15%. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it was the month of November, I believe, yeah. where they didn't score a single power play goal in that month. And that's really like the season got behind the eight ball right from the get go at that point. But with all those players, that firepower to only have a 15% power play is uh, absolutely absurd. I mean, even the, the Blackhawks, the Ducks, the Montreal Canadians, the Sabres, like all these teams had far better power plays. The San Jose freaking Sharks at least had a 20% power play last year. <laughs> and they barely had anyone on that roster. So uh, yeah. It was pretty, pretty abysmal, and I, I, I can't see it being that bad again. Uh, yeah. So that, that's got to be the one thing, though, that if you are a Penguins fan, that again, you're gonna hang your hat on and be like, if we just get a league average power play, a little bit better goaltending, they'll be in the fight. But uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. There's a lot of good teams in the East. There are, and you know, the other thing, the other stat that jumps out at me. They were 27th in the league in shooting percentage. Again, mm. with all that top-heavy talent offensively on the roster, 9.4% shooting percentage as a team last year. We'll see if they are able to sort of pick themselves up and improve in the upcoming season. But I agree with you. They are most likely going to be on the outside looking in. How about the New Jersey Devils? Here is a team that made a lot of moves during the offseason. Uh, and the biggest thing that I think they addressed, and you know, we talked about it with the Penguins, it being an issue. Last year, it was a bigger issue for the Devils, goaltending. And now they've got Jacob Markstrom coming in to, to be their number one goalie between the pipes. Yeah, and that was a massive move. I mean, last season, you, you look at how pitiful that goaltending was for the uh the 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 New Jersey Devils like they were right there the bottom five of the league in terms of goals against this past season uh goals saved above expected they were I believe the the worst in the league save percentage the worst in the league it was it was brutal uh they weren't really able to to buy a save and you know offense has never been the issue there they've got a new coach as well and Sheldon Keefe who I know very well from being you know covering the Toronto Maple Leafs I think he's a great coach uh but Markstrom comes in you get yourself a goaltender they've beefed up the blue line they added Brett Pesci Brendan Dillon you know you're hoping to get a step I, I know Luke Hughes is is going to be out for the first six weeks of the season but you know you hope to that he can really come into his own when he gets back and, and gets rolling Simo Nemich who was a top five pick uh you know a couple of years ago by this team so they got some some young blue liners to to help with the veterans Dougie Hamilton back from injury yep. so there's a lot to love and and you know our friends at FanDuel they love the the New Jersey Devils this year I think they have them as like the third shortest odds to win the Stanley Cup it's pretty high. Um, yeah, they 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 they're big on the on the New Jersey Devils fan train, and and so am I. I I for sure think that they're going to make the playoffs. Um, like if you're looking at teams, who who's gonna, you know, who missed the playoffs that will make the playoffs? Uh, for me, the the Devils are the number one team at at the top of my list. The teams they're just flat out too talented, and they got much much better by making the addition to with Markstrom. I think Keefe is a perfect style of coach for the players they have on that roster. And, you know, Jack Hughes, can he continue to ascend uh, into to superstar status? Can he stay healthy? That's all ultimately the biggest question and the biggest issue that you're going to have with the New Jersey Devils. It's seemingly every year someone's getting hurt and missing extended time. So that, that's that been very unlucky for the Devils. So if they can stay healthy, though, um, then this is, this is a good team, a really, really talented hockey squad. Yeah, I, I think two years ago, they kind of were a year ahead of schedule where everyone expected them to be. They overachieved a little bit, made the playoffs. Last year, boy, the injuries really hurt them and the goaltending. I mean, you talk about Jack Hughes, he missed 20 games and he wasn't 100% in all of them. And he still had 74 points in 62 games. And, yeah. and you know, you want to talk about a guy who I think just doesn't get a lot of national attention, but... If you watch him play all the time, he is really, really good. Jesper Bratt. I mean, there is a guy who doesn't get a lot of uh, kudos from the national media, but he'll he'll hurt you if you're playing a game against him. Yeah, and Nico Heischer. I I, yep. I remember speaking with uh, with an NHL. Uh, a, I think it was a, a former player 
Um, I'm trying to remember who. Maybe it was Ken Danico, I want to say, a uh, former New Jersey Devils player who's now currently with the team in a broadcaster role. I think he said, like, Nico Heischer is like a baby Bergeron. Like, he's that yeah. talented of, of a two-way force in the league, and he'll be, you know, in, in the Selkie nominations for the rest of his career pretty much, certainly throughout the uh, the prime of his career. So, you know, another player that uh, needs to just stay healthy for this team, and they've got a serious one-two punch with him and Jack Hughes. You know, they've got serious help on the wings. They've got decent depth, great goaltending and they beefed up that blue line and got a new coach who knows how to coach the heck out of a team can he get it done the playoffs remains to be seen didn't happen really with the with the maple leafs but maybe a new team you know new situation perhaps he'll find some success here with the devils and 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 actually he's he's got a goalie now which he never (laughs) truly had in toronto Right. And that always look that that's the most important position on the ice, obviously, especially come playoff time. I think the Devils are a a team that is very likely to make the playoffs this year after missing a year ago. I'm with you. I'm with you. All right. We still have two more teams to talk about the Philadelphia Flyers and the Columbus Blue Jackets, plus some big news out of Toronto and a major holdout going on as training camps open across the Eastern Conference. We've got all that and more coming up on today's Locked On NHL podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by your friends at Game Time. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. My favorite feature on Game Time remains the view from your seat. You go on the app, you get a panoramic view from your seat before you purchase the ticket so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Just download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-H-L for twenty dollars off, download Game Time today. What time is it? Game time. So let's talk a little Philadelphia Flyers, a team that I think a lot of people feel like they overachieved a little bit last year, and then down the stretch, they just kind of the wheels just kind of came off on the Philadelphia Flyers. Yeah, I mean, this is a team that was they were into it right to the the, the bitter end. And I, I didn't expect to see that. I, I really did not. I thought they were going to be one of the worst teams in the league last year. Um, and and that just wasn't the case. I believe they were in a playoff position like as late as, you know, late March. Um, they were right up in there and then really fell off at the end of the season after the trade deadline. Um, I, I don't see them putting it back together this year, though. I still think it's a team that's quite a ways away from being uh, being competitive and being ready to compete for a spot. They've got a lot of intriguing storylines and some intriguing players on that squad. I think everyone's going to have their eyes on Matt Vemichkov, the super talented Russian, uh, you know, winger that's coming over from the KHL. You know, he's, I believe, the favorite right now over on FanDuel to, to win Rookie of the Year, win the Calder. So he's kind of the big story for me that I'm going to be keeping an eye on when it comes to the Philadelphia Flyers. But, you know, they don't have a goalie. The defense needs some work. Uh, and, you know, there's not many stars, I guess we could say, uh, in that forward group. I, I like going Tippett. I like Travis Konechny. You know, thought Tyson Forster had a good season last year. Joel Farabee, obviously, Sean Couturier. What are you going to get from him? Um, not a team that I'm I'm overly confident in that that's going to win a lot of games here. Uh, could they punch above their weight again? I suppose. Uh, but it, it, when you look at this roster on paper, not the best, as Louis Domingue would say. Yeah, I would have to agree with with that assessment. Although, you know, they got more out of the talent last year than anyone expected. Can they improve the power play? Dead last in the league, 12.2% success rate. That was deplorable. Penalty kill, fourth in the league. Go figure that one out. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, really strong. Well, I, I, I will figure that one out. His name's John Tortorella. Yes, uh, he 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 demands a lot from his team, especially in their own end when it comes to the details. And you know that would explain the the, the penalty kill and uh, the fact that why they were in it so late into the year. John Tortorella always known for getting the most out of the least uh, in terms of coaching in the NHL. The power play again, it's it's kind of unexplainable how you could possibly have a twelve percent power play. Like that's just abysmal. League average is is up in and around twenty, twenty-one percent. So to be ten percent below league average is, is tough to do in the modern NHL, I would say, when goal scoring is is trending upward uh year by year and, and for you not to be able to score on the power play is is tough. But I think it's just a testament to, you know, the lack of firepower that is on that team like they don't really have those you know goal scorers who you think can eat up on the power play and get their cookies like sure Owen Tippett he's someone who's going to score for you on the power play but outside of Tippett I mean you just got a lot of question marks you know I guess Konechny will probably get you some some points on the power play but they don't really have a lot of you know offensively uh, gifted players we'll call it they've got some you know, decent players, some good players that could grow into something. But in terms of superstars, they they kind of lack that. Uh, maybe Mitrovkov becomes that, but might be a little early to to make that proclamation. But I, I wouldn't expect for that power play to be that much better, uh, better than twelve percent for sure. Yeah. But I, I don't think it's it's. We're not going to be talking about the Flyers having a, a top rated power play anytime soon. I don't believe. Are you concerned, you know, to me, and I'd love your opinion on this, to me, John Tortorella sort of has an expiration date. He, mm-hmm. as you said, gets the most out of guys who may not be the most talented, helps teams pay attention to detail, but it seems after three years or so, maybe guys start tuning him out a little bit. Are you concerned that this may start to happen to the Flyers this year? Possibly. I mean, there was that weird situation last year. Remember Sean Couturier named captain and then all of a sudden he's a healthy scratch like a week later. It was it was a really bizarre situation. And, you know, could that be a precursor to Tortorella losing the room? Perhaps. I mean, when you lose your captain like that, it's 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 not a good sign. So, yeah, I I think that's always going to be a possibility, especially with a young group. Uh, You did see Cutter Gauthier force his way out of of Philadelphia last year because he was not uh, in favor of of John Tortorella's antics, I guess we could call it. So, yeah, that's absolutely a, a possibility this upcoming season. Let's turn our attention to the Columbus Blue Jackets, uh, a team right now going through a, a lot. Yeah. Obviously, uh, the tragic passing uh, of Johnny Hockey a, a, a couple of weeks back. How does this team overcome that emotionally and get ready to start the season? It's it's tough, Gil. It's it's going to be real tough. I mean, this is you know two of the last three years they've had to overcome a, a, a tragic loss to one of their players in the organization, and and you know the first time they didn't find their footing uh, last off season, they went through the whole Mike Babcock saga at the beginning of trick of camp didn't find their footing after that. And, and, you know, it's, it's going to be real tough for them to do it again this year Uh, with, with Johnny Goudreau gone. He was the catalyst. He was, you know, their best player, but also, you know, based on everything that we've seen, all the outpouring um, support and and love shown towards Goudreau after his passing, he may have been the glue that kind of kept that group together. Like everyone seemed to love him and, and, you know, loved being around him. So that's going to be a big missing hole, not only in the lineup from a hockey perspective, but also in the locker room. Um, and that's going to weigh on this team mightily. Uh, it's it's going to be difficult for, for them to, to get it going. If they've got some young pieces, I do like Adam Fantilli to take a step this year. You know, eventually you'd think that Kent Johnson and that skill is going to to thrive and flourish. Yeager Chinnikov had some some solid, uh, you know, moments in, in the last couple of years. And Cole Sillinger got paid this offseason. He's going to have to uh, take a, a bit of a next step uh, this season. And then they, they did, they did bring in Sean Monahan. So they, they brought in someone who can, you know, be a veteran in that locker room. Who's worn a letter before. Um, and then, you know, we'll see what happens in that last year. That was just an absolute mess. Uh, Merzlikens and Teresa for Merzlikens was a mess in, in general. I think they allowed like 300 goals 
last year, which was the number one uh, in the NHL. No team allowed more goals than the uh, than this uh, this team, uh, at least in the Eastern Conference. San Jose allowed three thirty one, um, but yeah, not not a good spot for the Columbus Blue Jackets. Really tough off season. It's going to be a, a tough in season as well, I would imagine. Unfortunately. Yeah, I would think so. I mean, look, they've got to get the goals against down. That is going to be the key. I like the young talent on this team, but I I think they're still a couple of years away from really turning the corner and being playoff contenders. Yeah. And, and they even, you know, they, they moved on from Patrick line a too. Right. So like, you know, another player uh, who was considered one of their top weapons, top goal scorers that's gone. So you're missing, you know, Goudreau, you're missing line a, um, it's 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 going to be a tough tough for them to uh, to to score a lot. So if they're not keeping pucks out of the back of the net, they're not scoring a lot. They're not going to win a lot of games. So that's where I see things that they they missed the playoffs last year. I believe they were dead last, if I'm not mistaken, in the Eastern Conference a season ago as well. Uh, I I project the same outcome if I'm being completely honest uh, when it comes to the Jackets again this year. Yeah, I would tend to think we're roughly in that same boat. Uh, I, and, and it's a shame because it's a tough time off the ice. It's a tough time on the ice. But uh, y- y- you do see light at the end of the tunnel, I think. Well, I will say this. It's possible It's possible that they could rally around the situation. I mean, I think back to the Vegas Golden Knights' first year in the NHL, right? The Golden Misfits. No one pegged that team to make the playoffs, let alone go to a Stanley Cup final in their first year, right? They didn't have any superstars. They didn't, you know, that that wasn't a team that was supposed to compete. Um, they kind of galvanized around the shooting in Las Vegas and and things just really took off from there. So I don't know if it's the same situation, you know, maybe Johnny's smiling down on on the blue jackets and and perhaps, you know, we could see something beautiful happen this season. Um, so it's, it's not out of the question. We've seen weird things like that happen before. Uh, it's just not something that I'd, I'd want to bet on, I guess uh, is, is what I'd say. Yeah. So out of the four teams that we talked about, we concur it's the devils that have the best chance of getting into the playoffs this year after missing a year ago. Yeah. Not, not only the best chance, but I'll give it a, a Charles Barkley guarantee that <laughs> that group, uh, gets themselves into the postseason this year. All right, we shall see. Going to be an interesting season ahead for all four of these teams. We have got more to get to on today's show. The Toronto Maple Leafs have been sold. We have a big holdout among uh, an Eastern Conference contender. All of that, too. Yes, all of that coming up on today's Locked On NHL podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. You've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Well, we got something a little different for you. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then with a YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon at a market game. All you're going to need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel any time. Just visit FanDuel.com, slap down a $5 bet, download America's number one sportsbook. So the big news out of Toronto, uh, the Maple Leafs sold. Why don't you break this down for us, Mike? I know this is your area of expertise. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'll be going in into depth about this on the Lockdown Leafs podcast. We'll probably spend a little bit more time on it if people are interested in uh, in in how the transaction went and, and what the fallout could possibly be. Uh, but essentially, you know, the ownership with uh, Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, which is the organization that owns the Leafs, they also own the Raptors, uh, Toronto FC, the MLS Soccer Club. They also own the Toronto Argonauts, which is the, the CFL team. So they have uh, many teams that they own uh, all under an MLSC uh, umbrella, Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. So um, this was owned by three entities. There was one man, Larry Tannenbaum, that owned 25% of MLSE. And then there's the two big media telecom companies that had a, not a, uh, it wasn't a 50, 50, but they had an even split of 37 and a half percent ownership stake in uh, these companies. And today uh, Rogers, the one company bought out 
Bell Media. Bell sold all of their stock to Rogers, and now Rogers owns 75% of MLSE, uh, and it cost them a whopping $4.7 billion for 37.5% uh, of, of, uh, of the company, which gives the, the valuation of $12.5 billion uh, for MLSE. So, Quite, uh, quite, quite a significant uh, sale there. So, yeah, the Maple Leafs, uh, not necessarily new owners, but an ownership restructuring, we'll call it. And now Rogers Media Corp uh, owns basically the entire Toronto sports scene because they own the Toronto Blue Jays and they've been the sole owners of the Blue Jays for many years. And now are, uh, you know, majority owners of the uh, Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment Group, which is the the parent company that owns the Toronto Maple Leaf. So, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of an interesting set of circumstances uh, that 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 we're seeing here. One team make, taking up a, a massive monopoly in the city of Toronto and the Toronto sports landscape, uh, and and it'll be interesting to see what if anything changes uh, in terms of day to day, in terms of big picture things, uh, the ongoings of you know the Maple Leafs and and how things operate, but. Uh, a a massive sale to say the least. Four point seven billion dollars for thirty seven and a half percent of uh, of ownership stock in this company. So, uh, pretty pretty big deal here in the city of Toronto today. No doubt, and I think you know years from now we will look back at this and fully realize what the impact of it is. Right now, not always easy to to project that couple of holdouts going on. Uh, let's start with Jeremy Swayman in Boston. Talk to me about that. Did you hear the uh, Don Sweeney and what he had to say today about the holdouts and all that? He got pretty colorful. Uh, he did. Pretty colorful when, when speaking about it. He's he's not too pleased with how it's been reported. So I don't want to get on Don Sweeney's bad side here, Gil. So I'll, I'll just <laughs> report the facts as I know them and not add any gesture like some other podcasts apparently were doing that got him upset. Go find the audio if you want to know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, Jeremy Swayman did not report to, to training camp today. And Don Sweeney came out and said, uh, you know, he, he won't be reporting until a deal gets done. Um, he was expected to be the team's number one goaltender going into the season. They traded away Linus Allmark, who two years ago won the Vesna Trophy and decided to give the keys to the kingdom to, uh, to Swayman. And they made that trade without getting a contract done. He was a pending RFA. They did not elect to go to arbitration, either of them. They thought they'd be able to get a deal done before camp. Turns out they were unable to do so. Camp started today, opened up on Wednesday, and he was not uh, not present and doesn't plan to be unless he puts pen to paper. So it's a really interesting scenario right now for, uh, for Jeremy Swayman and the Boston Bruins. And you would think that they would make getting that contract done a priority before training camp opened after you trade away Olmark. You would think, you would think, because then all the leverage ended up on Swayman's side. And, and even right now, it's if you're the Boston Bruins, you look at that goaltending, it's like, yeah, Corpus Allo, I, I don't love that if that's your number one goalie going into next year. Right. Um, there's a lot of leverage uh, in the Swayman camp. So I, the fact that he missed out on day one of camp, I would imagine he continues to hold out and dig his heels in until you know the Bruins kind of come up from their number a little bit. Uh, what that number looks like, I, I don't know. I guess we'll find out. I do believe we will get it sorted out in the next couple of weeks. I'd be surprised if um, the regular season started and Swayman uh, has not put pen to paper, um, but we'll see how long it takes. And, and at least Boston does have some cap space to work with, so th th there is that. Uh, but we'll see how it all works out. And then another holdout going on that you mentioned? Yeah, I mean, the the... Detroit Red Wings, they, they signed one of their two big RFAs. They signed Lucas Raymond to a, a big contract, eight years, just a little over $8 million per season. But they still uh, have yet to sign his, you know, running mate, I guess we could call it, and Murray Sider, who still remains unsigned as as the big ticket RFA out there on the market at this point. And, and I saw today he's he's practicing, but not in Detroit, in Mannheim, Germany. He hasn't even crossed the pond yet. Uh, so... That's obviously a, a concern if you're a Detroit Red Wings fan. I know Detroit's looking to make that jump, um, you know, from being a, a perennial team that's not in the playoff race to getting themselves into the postseason for the first time in, I think it's like 10 years since they've been in, in the playoffs. It's been a very long time. 
Um, and it's it's not going to be possible unless they figure something out with uh, with, with this kid with with um, oh, I'm blanking on the name here. Sider. Murray Sider. Yeah, Mo Sider. Uh, so, again, I, I, I think we will get a resolution at some point uh, what that number looks like. The term uh, guess we'll find out. But uh, for now, no Mo Sider in Detroit. Yeah, something to keep an eye on. And obviously the Red Wings, as you said, cannot afford to start the season without him. I want to thank you for making Locked On NHL your first listen today. Now for your second listen, check out Locked On NHL Prospects, where you can learn about the future stars of the National Hockey League before they become stars. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Gil Martin. I'm I'm in today uh for ross levitan i want to thank you mike for uh, having me today always a pleasure talking a little hockey with you don't forget here on locked on nhl we're here every day monday through friday bringing you the biggest stories from around the national hockey league have a great day everyone stay safe and thanks for listening to the locked on nhl podcast